So let me let me introduce you, uh, Alessandro Romeo. Uh, he's working uh, at Chalmers yes. University. He got uh, he, uh, his uh, PhD degree in Trieste in the International School of, uh, for Advanced Studies uh, in 1990, uh, working with Denis Chiama. And Alessandro has dedicated an important part of, of his life um, studying the gravitational instabilities in galactic, in galactic disks. So that's what he's going to talk to us uh, today. And so uh, please go ahead. Perfect. So thank you very much. So then I start here. First of all, I would like to express all my gratitude to Javier for inviting me to this colloquium and for Sundar for organizing it so nice. And then I, I must say that I feel very proud, I'm very, very proud to, to talk to you because uh, during the years of my research, I've been coming through papers by Javier, by Enrique Vasquez Seradeni, Aldo Rodriguez Puebla, Vladimir Avilares. So we are exchanging mails. So I'm very, very happy about that. So as uh, Javier told you, I'm start, I will talk today about um, gravitational instabilities and in, parti in particular, present state-of-the-art diagnostics for this. Ah, so now it does not work. I have to do it in another way. Ah, assume that, but now that I have allowed to do this, it does not go. Yeah, that is strange. Ah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, because now with the cursor, I cannot go. So I have to, sorry. Ah, I cannot go out either. Oh, oh, we are yeah, looking yeah. at the motivation now. Oh, there, there it is. I saw Aha, the so there I have to most, press yeah. this. I have to press uh, because it's totally different now when we have changed the settings. How can I go back then? Okay, in that way, so it's totally different. Great. So uh, the motivations, of course, are quite clear since the gravitational instability plays a fundamental role in a galaxy dynamics and it enters a variety of processes. For example, everything has to do with the formation of spiral structuring galaxies, bars, bars within bars, and then going to smaller scales, formation of giant molecular clouds, formation of stellar clusters of stars. So once you have a, a, a topic, a, a, a phenomenon which is so uh, important is of course, other, at the same time, important to find uh, proper diagnostics in order to be able to understand whether the system you are, you are starting are stable or not. Okay, so this generally is done uh, with the so-called tumor stability criteria. Now, every one of you certainly know this because this is one of the standard tools for studying instabilities. So here we have uh, the Q parameter expressed in terms of uh, the surface density, then sigma is the velocity dispersion, and kappa is the epicyclic frequency. This is a little bit more stranger uh, quantity. It simply means that if you have, for example, a star in circular orbit, you give a little kick, then the star will oscillate around the circular orbit with a radial frequency, which is kappa. Okay, so this is a very, very, very standard tool for studying instabilities. However, there are several drawbacks. For example, we know that galaxy disks are made of stars, are made of several phases of the interstellar medium. So what you put here, it is the surface density of gas, which gas or stars, and here, what type of velocity dispersion are you considering? So from this point of view, then it's important to have a multi-component analysis. This was already understood in a seminar paper by Jog and Solomon in 1984. But I must say, to be fair, that the very, very first the pioneering work on gravitational instability in disks of stars and gas was actually pioneered almost 20 years before by Lin and Xu in a paper which is unfortunately very, very little quoted, but it's very important to make reference to that because they were the pioneers. Okay, so this is, we know that now that stars and cold interstellar gas have an important interplay in gravitational instability. And we know as well as a more recent result that not even 
stars and gas have very different properties from the point of view of, the, of, um, uh, of uh, gravitational instability, but as well the different phases of gas, atomic and molecular, namely because they have different surface densities and different velocity dispersions. So now you can say, uh, let us see what are the challenges of a multi-component analysis. So first of all, uh, let us introduce the concept of dispersion relation. So when I'm talking to you, okay, unfortunately I'm not doing this face-to-face, uh, -face, but I hope it's the same, I'm emitting sound waves, okay? And any sound waves and all other waves, there is a relation between the frequency of these oscillations and the, way, and the, the wavelength. Okay, so if you have a simple wave like a sound wave, you simply have omega equals c, where c is the sound speed, and then k, where k is 2 pi over lambda, the wavelength. Okay, but here the systems we are, which we are considering, you know, are much more complicated because they are supported against gravity, not only by uh, by velocity dispersion, so by pressure, but as well by rotation, and then they have they are self gravitating. So the dispersion relation is more complicated. If you now have a plot of the frequency squared versus the wavelength, now this is very meaningful because you can understand whether your systems are locally stable or unstable. For being stable, you will need that the omega square is positive. Uh, you say it's obvious. Well, no, it's not obvious because omega can in principle be a complex number. So if omega square is positive, it means that you have only real solutions which are like cosine and sine waves, okay? A little bit like the sound waves. So the system is stable. But if this omega square is negative, it means that you will have a growth rate how do I go back now? Uh, it means that you have a growth rate, a little bit like when you have a cannonball on the top of a hill. You leave, you give a little kick to the cannonball, then you will have hyperbolic motion. Great. So the idea would be that if you have a dispersion relation like this, you, um, this dispersion relation will depend on the properties of the disk. So you would like to find a parameter Q that if this parameter Q is one, then you have just one zero of this dispersion relation. And when Q is larger than one, you don't have any zeros because the dispersion relation goes up. And when you have a Q less than one, instead you will have a different instability regime. Now this is very simple when you have only one component, hmm? only gas or only stars, okay? Uh, but what happens when you have uh, different components? For example, if you have gas, stars, and so on. Well, there are complications. The complication is that your dispersion relation now, rather than having a simple minimum, it may have up to n minima. Okay, so if you have three components, it can have one minimum, two minima, or three. And unfortunately, there are no analytical solution for more than one component. And the other point is, of course, that you would like to find a convenient parameterization. And this is even non-trivial, even in the simple case of stars and gas. So when you have just two components. A, a proof of this is that um, for 10 years, people have been working on the same thing, namely. I wrote first the paper with Bertin in 1988, and then came out a series of other papers by Elmery 1995, Jog 96, Rafik of 2001, with the same criterion, but just with a different parameterization. Okay, so this is just to tell you that the things are quite complicated. Anyway, it's extremely important if we succeed to find not only a parameter that describes the instability, but as well this other output quantity, oh, lambda c, which is the characteristic instability scale. What it means is the size of the regions over which a gravitational instability develops. Okay, so these, these are very important. Okay, so what can you do? Of course, you cannot leave observers with very, very complicated equations to solve. So I have deposited a part of my, uh, of a few years of research 
to find useful, simple, and very, very accurate approximations, which follow from rigorous stability analysis. So the first one is, was introduced in 2011, and it's when you have systems, you consider stars and gas separately, and this approximation that I will show you uh, includes even the effects of the thickness of the galactic disk, which is generally almost ne always neglected. Okay, so then in a more recent approximate study, I generalized this work not only to different population of stars, but as well different phases of the interstellar medium. So uh, atomic gas, molecular gas, and so on. And it is ex extended as well the range of uh, um, vertical to radial velocity dispersion anisotropy, okay? So in the case of gas, we expect that if the if system is collisional, you should have something close to one. But when you have stellar disks, now these can really change by large factors. Okay, so I will describe now this last, um, this last uh, approximation because it's more general and as easy to use. Okay, so if we call now Q, uh, Romeo Falstad, then we have that one over Q is simply given by the sum over the components that you are considering of one over the Tumri parameter of each component, and then you will have a weight factors, T, sorry, T and W. So what are these now? So this is again, sorry, this is too sensitive now, speak up. This is the, but what is happening? It's, it's too sensitive, this cursor has become now. Okay, QI, then it's the Tumri parameter of component I, then T, is a factor which encapsulates the effects of the th thickness of the disk, and it is a very, very, very good approximation. And then uh, this W is a, a sort of weight factors which depends on the, this is too sensitive, on the velocity disper... I don't know what is happening with this cursor. Since we have changed with Sundar now, it's so sensitive. Okay, I, I, I say it in word, otherwise it changes the slide. So you see the, in the definition you have the velocity dispersion sigma m times sigma i, okay? And the sigma i is the velocity dispersion of component i. Sigma m is the velocity dispersion of a special component. And what is m? You find it in the second formula that you have downstairs. Uh, you see that uh, uh, m is the component which minimize T times Q, okay? So from a physical point of view, M is the component which drives the instability. How you can understand this? Because if you consider the formula for W, uh, you see that if uh, M equals I, okay, so if I equals M, then this W is just one. So you do, the weight factor of, the com of this component is just one. If instead the, the component I differs in velocity dispersion significantly from component M, then this uh, factor W is generally less than one. And the more the velocity dispersions are different, the more is dumping. So it's a weighting factor. Great. So this is not only a simple approximation, but it's very accurate. Actually, the accuracy is about 3% find the square root of the number of components which we are considering. And here, in fact, is the, the uh, a result, uh, a figure which illustrates this. So you see you have in, um, is a parameter space of two component disks. You have the ratio of velocity dispersion of gas over stars on the Ashissa. And the vertical scale, you have the a ratio between the two main components of gas and stars. So you see that the root mean square error is about 5% and the maximum error is 10%. Okay, and this is throughout all the relevant parameter space. So it's a very, very simple approximation and very, very accurate. So what you can predict doing that way, it's not only the local stability level of the disk, but as well which component dominates the process of instability. Uh, this is clarified, for example, in this figure. So this is show you uh, a sample of 12 uh, nearby star forming spirals, the sample uh, taken by Leroy et al. 2008. 
So a sample which is in common to Heracles for CR observations, uh, to uh, things for H1, and to things for the star. So if you look on the, on the left, you see now the gas to me parameter. You see how much is spread. And here you have, here you have the radius a scale respect to the optical radius, okay? The galactocentric distance. So you see that it changes by two orders of magnitude. Whereas when you see the in the right is my two component Q parameter, you see, first of all, that we, it's uh, dominated by the stars and not by the gas. And you see as well that it's very, very, it has a very, very narrow range of values. And we will talk more about that in a while, in a, in a more proper context. So let me first introduce as well this other diagnostic. So the uh, characteristic instability scale, which means uh, the size of the regions over which gravitational instability starts to develop. Okay, so this is very simple. It's 2 pi, the velocity dispersion of component M, divided by kappa, where the PC frequency. And M is, again, like before, is the component which minimizes Ti, Qi, which means it's the component, uh, turns out the component which dominates, which drives the gravitational instability. So now this uh, um, diagnostic, I will show you that predicts uh, the size of star forming complexes. For example, this is a very nice image, Hubble space image of the uh, NGC 7469. This is a luminous infrared cipher galaxy. And you see that. Um, uh, in between these two rings here, these two uh, circles, there are some um, star forming clumps which you, you, they have been measured. Okay, so if you now take a diagnostic and plot the Q parameter and the, the characteristic stability scale, you see that uh, it predicts exactly the transition between stability and instability and the uh, value of the lambda c turns out to be 108 parsecs on the median. And this is a comparable, very, very comparable to the estimated size of the star-forming complex in this galaxy. But there, is, there are many more interesting applications. For example, you can predict the, the sizes of star bursts and bars within bars. Now, this is an amazing galaxy, and you see 6946 is one of my pet galaxies. First of all, it has a three bars, one inside the other. Okay, this is, this is amazing dynamics, and it's a starburst galaxy. So the outer bar is actually a oval, and it is outside the range of the observations. It will be on the six kiloparsec. But now look what happened in the bottom panel when we consider the characteristic instability scale. Okay, the green lines that you see here, sorry, it's so sensitive this, I don't know, since we have changed with Sundar, it's as soon as I touch it's becoming. Okay, but you see that there are three green lines, one at one kiloparsec corresponds to the secondary bar, and then we have two very, very, very close at about 200 parsec from the center. And these correspond to the nuclear bar and the nuclear starburst. So now look at the bottom panel and you see how the mind stability lambda C uh, diagnostic deep precisely at those locations. Okay, so this is amazing because generally bars and bar sitting bars are considered to be the result of global instabilities. So the fact that you have so much accurate uh, matching here, it means that in reality they are given more by local processes. Okay, but there is another another galaxy which is extremely nice to consider is NGC 1068. It's a powerful starburst plus a cipher galaxy. Actually, it is the, the main prototype of cipher two galaxies. Okay, so in this nice figure that you have on the left done with the ultra, uh, you ultraviolet space telescope, uh, you find in blue uh, a, a, a very, very extended starburst disk, whose size is about the three kiloparsec. And the first circle that you see, the first here, white, it's very close it's very close to what is called the starburst pseudo ring, which observer like very much because it's likely more luminous than, uh, than the rest of the part. 
So you see even here that um, uh, when you consider the bottom panel, okay, we are considering now molecular gas, you see that you have uh, that you have a dip precisely at the corrotation resonance of the secondary bar, okay, which is really great. And then you may be interested to look at the Q-tumor parameter just for molecular gas. And then if some of you have studied a little bit, have, have made a little bit research on, on feedback, then you will be very, very surprised and very happy. Because this plot shows you that the tumor parameter of molecular gas uh, has a deep as a minimum precisely where uh, you expect to have the starburst pseudo ring. And just before and just after this ring, then the, the profile of the Q parameter goes up. And so you, will be, you would be tempted to say that this is the result of the feedback uh, here from the active galactic nucleus and here from the star forming disk. Hmm. But uh, you can see here, this is not the end of the story. And so we will talk a little bit more about this just after. Let me just construct step by step. Okay, so now a recent application about what drives gravitational instability in nearby star forming spirals. And here you will see how important is uh, to uh, compute directly, to uh, derive observed CO and H1 velocity dispersions. So this is actually a, a figure which represents the 12 um, nearby star forming spirals considered by Leroy et al. 2008. So they have really fantastic data for molecular gas through the Heracles survey, great data for the atomic gas through the FINS survey, and great data for the stellar component through the SINS survey. Okay, so now here what you're looking at is the CO velocity dispersion. Okay, the radial profile, everything normalized with the optical radius. Uh, the, the red uh, data points are, were derived by me and uh, Moses Mogotzi in a paper that is, you find reference there. And the blue lines, six kilometer per second and 11 kilometer per second, are somewhat typical um, observationally motivated values of the velocity dispersion of molecular gas, as suggested, for example, by, by Kennecat in 1998 and by Leroy et al. 2008. So you see, it's very nice here, these plots, because they, they show that. Uh, for example, in this galaxy here on the bottom, you can really have an order of magnitude difference with respect to what is the motivation, um, observationally motivated values, okay? And here already the story about this velocity expression, why they increase towards the center is fantastic. I will not have time to tell you the, the whole story, but I just tell you that it is consistent with the process of radial inflow. When the gas is inflowing towards the center of a galaxy, then the surface density of the gas increases and the epicyclic frequency increases, okay? But the surface density increases more, so the tumor parameter ten tends to become less, uh, so then you promote instability, so the velocity dispersion has to get bigger and bigger and bigger in order to saturate this stability, and this is what you're looking here. Um, the similar things you can see in the uh, atomic hydrogen, you see that even in this, in this case, the approximation which is generally done, 11 kilometers per second, for example, by Leroy et al., may be very, very different from uh, the observed data. Okay, so if you then use these really observed velocity dispersions and all the beautiful surface density epicyclic frequency obtained by uh, the Heracles uh, things and the SIM survey, then you, you can really calculate the profile of the three component Q parameter. Three component means that you are considering not only molecular gas as well atomic gas and the stars. And now these apparently simple figures actually has two layers of information. The first layer is quite simple and direct. You see this very, very black line is the local medium of the data points. And these show that it is a remarkably constant across the optical disk. 
Okay, so this is something very, very, very nice and suggests that uh, um, galaxy disks are subject to a process of self-regulation, okay? Great. The other thing that you notice is that this line is very above one. It's more between two and three. And this is not strange because, again, a Tumri parameter uh, is concerning uh, axisymmetric instabilities, a little bit like rings. Whereas in galaxy, of course, you have the potentiality of, in, of having strongly non-axisymmetric perturbations. So when you do a complete analysis about these, then you discover that the critical level of instability is no longer one, but is between two and three, even when you consider the effect of gas dissipation, okay? So the second layer of information now, it's uh, even more important. It tells you the, the component that is driving the instability. And we, the implication we see even better in this figure. So here, what I have here on the right is the characteristic instability scale, which means again, the size of the regions over which gravitational instability develops. Okay, and you see here, that the instability is produced by stars, okay? So you have a typical value of a few kiloparsec. And the instability is almost never, uh, sorry, is almost never produced by, by gas. But now, uh, to be able to understand the implications of this work, then I give you a subliminal image, okay? So allow me, it will just be for three seconds. So please try to memorize it because I will not show it again. Okay, so this shows what happens when instead of having observed velocity dispersion, you put instead the values that people generally have used during the entire life. So either 6 km per second for atomic gas, for molecular gas, and 11 km per second for atomic gas. So look here. Okay, so you see that there were a lot, many more red points. Mm -hmm. which means that if you don't do an analysis considering the observed velocity dispersion, then you can totally be misled that gas plays an important role. But you see here now, now it does not go forward. Okay, here. Okay, so what we get now are three um, conclusions. So first of all, the size of the regions over which disk instabilities develop <coughs> is one order of magnitude larger than the tumor length of molecular gas, okay? So this is really almost revolutionary because people generally, I've been thinking that the tumor length of molecular gas, okay, is the, inst the classical instability scale. The second point is that these instabilities then are driven, in fact, by the self-gravity of stars at kiloparsec scales. And then that this is true across the entire optical disk of every galaxy in the sample with few exceptions. And these few exceptions were uh, one of the galaxies that I showed before, NGC 6946, and the, the Whirlpool galaxy. And you can even show, these were very, very few points, that if you consider the systematic uncertainties in the CO to H2 conversion factor and in the mass to light ratio, then even those red points can become green. Okay, so then you can ask, Alessandro, what the hell are you telling us? <laughs> I mean, so now if you have that these instabilities are driven by the stellar component on kiloparsec scales, how can the poor interstellar gas uh, uh, collapse and fragment? Well, this is exactly what we are going to see in this other diagnostic. So you see here again is the parameter space of uh, stellar star gas instabilities. You have the ratio between velocity dispersion and the ratio between the two parameters. Uh, you see that this triangular uh, reddish uh, region is uh, a region within which, within which the dispersion relation has two separate minima. The minimum that you have at short uh, wavelengths it represents the response of the cold interstellar gas. The minimum that you have at large wavelengths that is representing instead the response, response of the stars. What happens instead in this bluish region that the dispersion relation has just a single minimum. 
And in this single minimum, the gas and stars are really dynamically coupled. Okay, whereas in the red regions, they are decoupled. So in the blue regions, coupled means that if you do something or one component, so for example, if, you, if the stars are destabilized, then the gas follows on the potential well and gets unstable as well. And this is in fact the case. You see all the observational points, okay, with just a few exceptions, are in this region. So this means that uh, even though the gravitational instability is promoted, is driven by the stars by means of their self-gravity, uh, the already formed stars, in reality, the interstellar medium follows them. And, but this is an induced process. It's not the real process of instability. Okay, so I will have very, very, many, many brand new applications to tell you, but unfortunately we have no time. So I just make a pointer to some re more recent papers where you can see that um, uh, using this diagnostic, you can actually study the link between angular momentum and gravitational instability in galaxy disk. Uh, you can even have a new set of tight scaling relations from massive spirals, dwarf irregulars, and you can even study the stellar to halo mass uh, uh, relation and see that there is a very, 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 very um, uh, low scatter relationship from integer super compact dwarfs. So, in case you're interested, please refer to those papers. Okay, so then now that we have seen that in normal galaxies, normal spiral galaxies, uh, instabilities are driven by the stellar component, you may be ask, you may ask, what about this NGC 1068? You remember this was a very special type of galaxy, starburst and uh, bar, and then you have a active, with, with very, very active uh, uh, nucleus inside. So you may think that there, gas plays a more important role. Let us see a little bit. So this is what we obtained before. I was showing you the, um, the profile of the tumor parameter. And you remember we have been discussing about the location of the minimum, which correspond to the starburst pseudo ring and to the possible effect of AGN and stars. But what happens now when, sorry, it's going too fast. What happens when you consider not only just gas, but coupled with the stars? So you use my diagnostic. Well, these stars make a really a, a big difference. You see now that the tumor parameter is always below one. This is actually the only galaxy which I've seen in the entire life, which such a small a tumor, such a small Q stability parameter. So it's really a monster, okay? So this tell you that please do not consider only gas when you want to understand the stability of your system. You have to consider as well the stars and you can do it very easily consider, um, using my diagnostics. Okay, and in the, in the case as before, you see from the data that both gas and stars uh, are coupled, so there is no problem from a conceptual point of view. The stars drive the instability because of their larger self-gravity, but then star, the interstellar medium follows afterwards and then gets unstable afterwards. Great, so this is then, this galaxy has shown uh, that you have violent star-driven gravitational instability caught in the act even in a galaxy which is starburst and superactive that one would expect to be more or less uh, everything, all the nice dynamics encapsulated by the interstellar medium. Very good. So let us see then, uh, last but not least, the stability map of turbulence, which is a useful diagnostic for gas-rich galaxies, both at low and high redshift. Okay. So now here, I know that you have in the department, you have people who have turbulence in the blood, like Yavir and like Enrique Vasek Sebadeni. Okay, so for, for, forgive me if I make, if I tell in just a few seconds, a few, in a minute, the anecdote of Heisenberg. So Heisenberg, the famous quantum physicist, said that I hope that before dying, someone will explain me quantum mechanics. Okay? He was so modest. But then he said as well, I hope that after that, God will explain the turbulence. This is just to tell you how complicated it is. So um, one of the complications that you have in turbulent systems, you can see it here, is that uh, in turbulent systems, the 
the, the surface density and the velocity dispersions, they depend on the size of the regions over which they are measured. Okay, and um, so this is, you cannot do, uh, there are no theories about uh, turbulence that are only models. And even the most complicated models, I mean, there are always some very, they will never capture the whole physics. So anyway, I have used then here a phenomenological approach similar to the approach followed by Enrique, I don't know if I pronounce right, but Enrique Vasquez Sebadeni, okay, 1995 together with Adriana Grasov and Bonazzola a few years before. So namely you have these scaling laws and you plug them into the dispersion relation and you see what happens. What happens now is marvelous because you feel, you know, like a, a pioneer because Nobody has done this in the case of galaxy disk. And here you have, you can classify all the different stability regimes. You can put the observations. For example, you see that H1 observations are there. So for example, when you compute, when you uh, observe the uh, uh, H1 intensity emission and you calculate the power spectrum, then you can deduce this A and B parameters there. You can put um, theoretical models like the one of, uh, Kitsiona, same fleck. Uh, you can put here uh, observed points as well for giant molecular clouds. You can see where the fractal uh, dimension is good or not. So if we now limit ourselves to the white part of the plane, which is where you, you don't have problems at, uh, concerning the fractal dimension, you see here that you have three regimes, okay? Regime A is a regime which is very close to B tumory. Uh, in particular, the tumor parameter gets very different and the criterion as well, but still, provided you find the right formula, then you can predict the stability of the system. But then here we have a regime C, this regime C is very strange, because whatever you do to the tumor parameter, so however large is the velocity dispersion in comparison to the the, to the surface density, then you will never be able to cure this gravitational instability. Okay, so this is small scales are unstable. And you find a regime B, which is a transition regime. Okay, so in this regime B, you have that uh, partly the tumor parameter, uh, partly uh, you cannot control the instability. And what do you find there? Well, it's the, the typical story. It's the cursor is too quick, uh, is the, the place of giant molecular clouds, yeah, at least if you believe to large on scale laws. Uh, there is a more updated version of this map in Romeo and Argets where you find all the uh, different uh, observational uh, um, regions for atomic gas and for, uh, at for atomic gas and molecular gas. So once you have now this map, in pre you would like to understand how uh, how is the onset of turbulence in galaxy disks? Okay, so you can either use a high redshift observations and populate these, for example, seeing the trace, the tracks that our B and A parameters are doing, or in the meanwhile, that observation become powerful enough, you can do this with observations. And this is what actually we have done uh, with uh, Oscar Rogers and as a PhD student. So you see here that you have two simulations which are, have totally different output. You see here on the bottom, you have a simulation which is done with a very, very state of the heart routine for uh, the feedback from stars, from supernova, everything. And on the top, you have instead a simulation which is done with a little bit too less feedback as uh, certain simulations have done before. The amazing thing now is that when you, com when you compute the tumor Q parameter, you see that it's very similar in both cases. You said very similar, so you have no, even though you consider it only for gas, for stars, or for a double system, you cannot really tell the difference. But if you locate now these simulations in my stability map of turbulence, you see that the first one, you see that is a very, very, very clumpy, occurs in this regime C, where I predict that small scales are unstable. Whether the other one, this, the one made faithfully, then goes to regime A, which is the one uh, um, 
the, the one where you have tuber-like instability, okay? So this is a, a little bit of what I wanted to tell you. I hope there is a lot of time for discussion. And just I have a very simple conclusion. I hope to have convinced you that this a parameter that I introduced is Q, lambda, and the stability map turbulence are promising diagnostics for probing the link between gravitational instability, inter interstellar medium turbulence, star formation, and inner structure galaxies. So please feel free to use them and ask if you want to know more. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alessandro. Thank you for this nice talk. Thank you. So do we have, uh, we have quite a bit of time for questions. Uh, so that yes. we see some raise hands. Okay, I don't Javier. Hear. Javier, go ahead. Okay, so thank you. Hey, thank I don't you, hear. Okay. Yes. Okay. One, two, three, do you hear me? Yes, now Hello? yes. Okay, yes. okay. So thank you for your for your interesting talk. I think it's a, it's an amazing work that you have done. Yeah. Thank uh, you very much. I was wondering, in the first part of the of the talk, you didn't consider all this turbulent stuff, all these scalings of the gas. Great question. Just, it's just uh, the, the typical tumor parameter for different components. Is that so? Yes. Yes. Okay. And, and yeah, are you going to say something? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's, uh, there are a lot of noise. I don't know where they come from. Yeah, I'm sorry, it's my home. <laughs> Aha, yeah, exactly. Is, okay, okay, okay. Is, okay, class because there, I could, so. okay, exactly, me here. Okay, so I can, you are perfectly right. And in fact, this is the reason why I said here, you see, when you have, uh, uh, when you have galaxies which are at the present epoch of evolution, so if, if you have normal spirals and, and galaxies like this, so not the dwarfs and so on, then the gas that you find is still turbulent, okay? So you can redo all this stability analysis which are done with a very simple diagnostics. You can do this as well incorporating turbulence and you will not find the difference in results. The only difference is that, that you don't find a very, very simple approximation. So this is why I didn't present it because of course then you have to go through the dispersion relation and so on. But the rule of thumb, so the whole take home message, if it, when you have it in the present day universe, so if you have galaxies like uh, lenticular spirals and even quite large um, um, dwarfs, then the analysis neglecting turbulence still works. But as soon as you are considering galaxies, for example, at high redshift, where gas is very, very, very massive, with respect to the stellar component, or for example, in very, very small dwarf regulars. Then in that case, if you forget about turbulence, then you're forgetting about any, any essential ingredient. I don't, I don't hear now. Uh, okay, okay, I see. So, uh, well, I guess there is some more, I have many questions, so I can, yes. I can go back. Uh, maybe somebody else wants to ask something. Thanks, Javier. Uh, Bernardo? Hi, thank you. Um, can you hear me? Alessandro? Yes, very well. I have to actually to decrease the volume now. Ciao, Bernardo. <laughs> hey, hola, hola. Sorry, hi. Uh, very nice talk. I'm very interested in your new proposal of this new tumbri like parameter. Yes. Uh, especially for the inner structure of galaxies, like bars and so on. Yes. Uh, how would, would that apply to low surface brightness galaxies where so, they, what, how, how it would apply to low surface brightness galaxies where the exactly. gravity is imposed by the, by the dark matter halo and not the components. Exactly, of the exactly. Uh, this is a very, very, very nice question. And I cannot answer it now with the overheads that I have. I just want to show you Wait a second, okay, because it, it was written here. Yeah, you see. So here, uh, you see, it's something amazing. I, if you ask me why it happens like that, I don't know. But in these two, sorry, I have to take the right, uh, yes, here. So in these two recent papers, which I have discussed with Aldo, let us see how it's with Rodrigo Suebla and Vladimir Avila Reyes, so I'm applying my diagnostics to actually not only spirals, but as well dwarf irregulars, lenticulars, and even blue compact dwarfs. And something which is amazing, 
that even though you forget about turbulence, okay, so if you are doing that bloody, the, the, the dirty things, so you just forget about the most important ingredient, then you get, uh, let us see if I can show you this with my screen. Uh, you see here, I, you, expect, wait a second if I succeed to open this window. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you see here, now we have, uh, this, can you see it from no, the screen? No, you're still showing the presentation. Aha, uh -huh. uh, how can I do this? Aha, uh -huh. because of course, because, because we have set, so I should, uh, oh, I cannot show you, but... I mean, maybe you can stop sharing the screen and choose another screen. Aha, uh -huh. okay, so wait a second, okay, so I, I stop share, mm -hmm. okay, and then I, let us see what is this, this paper, this, and then I do this share again. And then I, I take now the, the, the desktop. Okay, so you see these figures. Bernardo? Yes, yes, perfect. Yes, but so this is the Stella to halo mass relation, okay, which you have in the two popular forms. So M star over MH versus MH versus M star. So you see that in both cases with star galaxies, these are galaxies with exceedingly good rotation curves and actually K photometry. Okay, uh, so you see what happens now that uh, you see, look at my, look at this panel here. This panel here, the, the top left is just obtained with gravitational instability, uh, the classical diagnostics, forgetting about turbulence. And you see that, um, you can see from the color mapping, so that uh, you have uh, from lenticulars, then you go to blue compactors, that everything follows a line with a standard deviation of less than 0.2 dex, okay? Which is much less than the standard stellar to halo mass relation. So this is amazing, and we discussed this in this paper, uh, when we talk about here towards the conclusions. So you, I cannot tell you now, but you can see really see it is really intriguing about such complexity and it's exciting. So it's actually amazing that it works. So even for low surface bright galaxies and galaxies for which you cannot even define a real disk because of blue compact dwarfs, I mean, <laughs> what mm -hmm. is the disk there? Well, it's amazing that it works if you use these diagnostics. I mean, they are in a line. Okay, so please, I, I refer to this paper and I hope that you get very interested and maybe oh, we, okay. can, uh, we can do can, some can project you, together. Can or... you show us the authors or the name of the paper? Yes, surely. <laughs> it's me. You. Yes, perfect. You see from here is me, uh, Oscar Ogers, who was a previous student of mine, and Florent Renault. Thank you very much. Yes, and with the same authors, we have a new paper in preparation where we are populating the stability map of turbulence with simulations and see how uh, the turbulence setups in galaxy disks. Perfect, thanks. Thank you. So, so I put, uh, I, th then I put, I stop the share and then I put again then this, see, and then I open again here, share the screen. And In the I meantime, uh, I don't know who this yes. is, but the user that WF wall that uh, had a question, please go ahead. Yes. Hi, yeah, um, your talk is filled with uh, very uh, interesting information. It's just filled with it. And, uh, but I, I'm wondering, uh, you found something that, I mean, in hindsight, isn't it kind of obvious? Maybe it's not that obvious, but um, you found that the stars, which dominate the mass of the disk, um, uh, dominate the uh, effects of the instabilities. Um, so is that surprising? Uh, somewhat, yes. Sorry, could you tell me your name so that I can see you? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm William Wall. What's um, your name? Eh? William Wall. What? Yes. So... Very good, volume, very good. So this is the reason. So uh, if you have a little bit of, uh, uh, if you go in the, in, in the formula that we had before, you can even see this when we talk, uh, uh, wait a second, okay. Okay. So from this formula here, you say, or from even the genes criteria when you have two components, 
you see that the contribution of a component does not depend only on how massive it is, so on the surface density, but it depends very much on the velocity dispersion. So for example, even in the simple genes case, where you have the genes for stars and gas, okay, so even without the tumor parameter, without the, the disk geometry, then you understand that you have a raw volume density of, of a component divided by the square of the velocity dispersion. Okay? So the, this tells us that uh, you can have a very massive component and another one which is not as massive, but is very cold. So because of this, this cold component can even dominate the instability. It's a little bit like when you are teaching, you have a class of very, very silent students, and then suddenly you have two or three who are talking a lot, okay? They are underrepresented, but they make the main contribution to the noise, okay? So it's a little bit like this in, 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 uh, in gravitational instability. It's not the component which has the largest surface density, Okay, but it's a compromise, a trade-off between the surface densities and the velocity dispersion. So while uh, uh, from, a, from an intuitive point of view, it might seem that stars should always be more important, well, in reality, if you, if you go through astrophysical papers studying star formation and trying to use uh, uh, tumor criteria, what they do is that they consider just the tumor criterion of the gas, for example, in the paper by chemical. And the argument there was because stars are born from the gas, okay, and gas is coal. So even though it seems obvious, it is not actually. But thank you very much, because this was a very, very, very good question. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Javier, you can come back. Yeah, so sorry if I ask a dumb question. Um, no, there are no dumb questions. <laughs> <laughs> so when you consider different components, Yes. What, I do do, what you are doing is that you are considered like if the gas is alone and then you have one Q and then the, the stars are alone and then no, 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 this is, no, no, the analysis that is done is actually considering the Poisson equation of all these couple components. But uh, when you, uh, I, I have found through an analysis, uh, very, this formula which come out are extremely complicated if you have already more than one component. But uh, you can refer to the paper by, that I mentioned before, Romeo and Vigia, Romeo Falstad. You can see that we, with a lot of effort, one can simplify this, okay, so that uh, they decouple, but they are not decoupled, so it's only apparent, you see, because QI, you remember the QI uh, here, you see, if I go further, W high is mixing the component, okay? You have a component I, and here you have the component that has the minimum T, Q, okay? So the components are never considered alone. It's really a study done rigorously with all the post equations and so on. Everything is coupled. And then at the end, you can approximate fortunately, thank God, with this very, very simple formula, which has an uncertainty of just a few percent. Okay, I see. So um, let me think a little bit. Um, so from from this paper by Jock, 2013, I guess you know it. Yes. He gets the the, the gene length. Uh, uh, what uh, what I get from from that gene length is that what you have to consider at every point will be like the equivalent uh, density. The density of all the gas that is behind, no, that is not part of the cloud, and then compare it to the gas to, to the density of the cloud, and that will be like enough to 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 get yes. this length. So, but uh, yeah, somehow but I, I don't know how to match these two views, no. No, exactly. I but know you, if you have if you have uh, thought about that, this is yes, this is a why a very very wise uh, question. So the fact that you still have a big gap between galaxy scale analysis, okay, and the clamp scale analysis, 
So this is why there is a little bit, not a very much still a bridge between experts in one field and the other, even though everyone is studying star formation, but there are all these different scales. So I perfectly understand your answer. And I point again to this stability map of turbulence. So here you see that um, regime A is the one that you expect uh, on the galaxy scale. Okay, and the regime C is the thing that you expect from a gene's point of view scale. So this re regime B, which is a transition, is what I think and I hope to prove it together with uh, Oscar Ogertz and uh, Florent Reno in this new paper which comes out, is a regime of transition which, according to us, establish a link between the large scale galaxy dynamics and the small scale clamp dynamics. Okay, I have to think about that. <laughs> yes, there is a lot of things. It's not obvious because I mean there are, mm -hmm. I mean the, the the analysis that I've been talking about are still talking about the disk and gravitational instabilities. So the scale, the smallest scale that you are considering here is something about fifty parsec, certainly larger than ten parsec. Whereas the scales that you are talking about are possibly subparsec and so on. So there is still an order of magnitude gap. And it is not said that in this our life we can do anything miracles because it's, I mean, it's so complicated physics. I mean, as soon as you go to smaller scales, you have to have a very faithful description of feedback mechanisms and all things that are called subgrid models by simulators okay so not, not even using the best simulation now in the world you can actually succeed to to represent well both the galaxy scales of the order of one kiloparsec or more and the subparsec scales i mean everything done is with these uh, tricks which is called uh, uh, subgrid models which means that when you go below the resolution of your simulation, which presently is something about a few parsec, then you are telling how stars form. So in, in particular, even though you are, for example, at high redshift, you are imposing phenomenological laws that you have studied at low redshift. Okay, so it's, it's uh, even those who are doing very, very complicated simulations business, I mean, uh, uh, you cannot, I, I will not put the hand on the fire. So even, this is even more so for theory. Okay, so and now, uh, well, if there are no other questions, uh, just a comment. Uh, I, I've been um, arguing that this uh, scaling between the column density and the size is... is I knew uh, this, I knew this, exactly. <laughs> okay. I know your favor. <laughs> yeah, so instead, I, I mean, I think there, there is a math relationship, uh, a math relation, uh, yeah, scale law, did you say, so so to speak, but but it's not a power law with the slope of two or something like exactly. that. But exactly. instead, it's something more like a, a curve uh, that goes from almost two at small scales to and flattening outwards. Exactly. That's my impression exactly. for uh, of, the, of, of what I get for for for, for absolutely. My and actually, I like your paper very much. And actually, I would say. Isn't he asking me about this? Absolutely. So this uh, stability map of turbulence that you have there, uh, it does not make distinction between uh, the fact what, what is the source. So even if these scaling laws are not produced by turbulence, but arise by other kind of mechanisms, for example, in your case, it was gravitational collapse, if I remember correctly, it doesn't matter. It is always the same schedule. And actually, I tell you even more. So when you go to this, uh, um, Next, so the simulation that we have performed with my student Oscar August 2015. Well, this simulation to be able to do this regime A, regime B, there, of course, you don't have a perfect power law with two. Okay, so he, there we have solved the dispersion relation and seen how the, the uh, taking uh, A and B, so these parameter A, A and B were actually themselves a, a function of the scale like you are saying okay so exactly so it it is the theory is there i mean you you cannot uh, um it, it's more complicated than the previous uh, uh, approximation that i showed but you can plug everything the machine is very simple actually so you can predict this and there will be this okay. new nice. paper with the uh, florent Renault about this absolutely okay thank nice. you
Thanks, okay. Javier. Uh, we have time for maybe one more question from somebody else. Yes, it's behind the Javier. <laughs> I see you. What's your name, man? Eh? Aha, it's your son. Ah, yeah, Charles Sebastian. That's yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Okay, if there are no other questions, uh, let's thank Alessandro again. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alessandro. Thank you very much. Arrivederci. Thank you very much.